Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture for English 2090. Today we're going to discuss narrative in films, really focusing on the power of cinematography to create narratives and metaphors. So in terms of what cinematography is, if you're unfamiliar with it, classic kind of film dictionary definition, the art or technique of motion picture photography. Obviously the director, being the chief creative person for a movie, is in charge of the cinematography along with what we call either the cinematographer or director of photography or dp in film speak you'll always hear like on the set you know anyone who's dp that's the director of photography or cinematographer they're also in charge of you know the actual camera the lighting the electrical cr the crews you know excuse me all the different facets that make a scene right make a visual element in front of that camera so telling a story on film isn't just, of course, about recording the action. It's also about how the images are captured. So in television and film world, right, this is known as, of course, cinematography. Now, going back to the idea of the metaphor that we talked about in the theme lecture. So as a reminder, it's a figure of speech that makes an implicit, implied, or hidden comparison between two things that are you know, usually unrelated but which share, of course, common characteristics. In other words, a resemblance of two contradictory or different objects is made based on a single or some common characteristics. In literature and film, it could also be a figure of substitution, which one object is put for or said to be another. One example of a metaphor is the contract. So if we're looking at Faustus, right, the contract between Faustus and Satan slash, you know, Faustus and Mephistopheles, you know, there is a metaphor here. And if you look and actually study what kind of Marlowe is conveying about the contract, well, it's a metaphor for how dangerous legal contracts can be between lawyers and, of course, the untrained. So obviously, you know, rise of, you know, industrialization complex, rise of capitalism, all that. Contracts never really existed, right? So, when, you know, what, what we're seeing here since this play is Renaissance, right, the rise of middle class, self-fashioning, all sorts of ideas that have influenced how we conduct commerce today. Well, the contract then is, can be very dangerous, right, for someone who's illiterate or for someone who doesn't know, right, legal speak and so forth. So what Marlowe is doing is using the contract between Faustus and Satan as a reflection of how legal experts can create documents that are dangerous for people who are ignorant of all the laws of the land, right? He's attacking, right, the idea of legal speak because if you, not only do you have to read, you have to be able to read this legalese, right, this legal speak now. So even though... Obviously, you know, we're not dealing with, um, you know, huge amounts of scenes. But if you look back and kind of trace how Marlowe is depicting the contract within the dialogue, there's a lot of references that you could look at in terms of using this as a metaphor for the legal contract in and of itself. Now, when we talk about visual metaphor, we're focusing, focusing excuse me, on this idea of mise en scène. It's French for placing on stage. It's an expression used to describe the design aspects of a theater or film production, which essentially means, you know, visual theme or telling a story. When applied to the cinema, mise-en-scene refers to everything that appears before the camera and its arrangement, composition, sets, props, actors, you know, costumes, lighting, everything. Along with the cinematography and then editing of a film, right, the mise-en-scene will influence that, you know, verisimilitude idea going back to, you know, the truth-seeming of a film, in the eyes of its viewers. It expresses, of course, the visual metaphors depicted in a film that help enhance the film's characters, tones, symbols, themes, what have you. So, in terms of P.D. Wheatstraw, right, even though it's a comedy, we're still going to deal with mise-en-scene. Now, this is not an on-set term. This is not a production term. So, like, when you're on set, you're not going to use this term. You're going to be thinking about cinematography, but you're not going to really use this term. You don't go around, like, let's change the mise en scène and all that stuff. That's something that the DP, the director, and all that will look to and kind of look at how everything looks. But also, you're going to be in the hands of CGI people. You're going to be in the hands of editors, right, who might actually crop the film too so it's an all-encompassing kind of idea so from the workers who build the sets to the cgi designers to the cinematographers to the actors to costume designer all these things will result in the collaboration of many film professionals that will lead to the mise-en-scene 
A lot of times this is a what we would refer to as a post-production term in a way. Once it's actually produced, once it's sent to the audience and so forth, that's when we kind of start looking at the mise-en-scene. So like what happens with this final product? So even with our character here, you know, kind of think about what visual metaphors and narratives this shot can convey, right? You have a character who, again, Peter Reestraw is going to be the uh, adaptive equivalent of Faustus. So you have him, again, black, red. So we have very devilish colors. He has uh, the um, satanic pimp cane. So that gives him all his powers. So, you know, you could see the struggle here between, you know, P Peter Reestraw and then the power of turning into the devil and all these things, right? So losing one's humanity, same thing. Again, even though we're dealing with a comedy, this is how serious the visual aspects are taken a lot of times. Here, again, notice the red and black color schemes, you know, the kind of, you know, invoking the devil kind of color schemes that we are traditionally thinking of. And even just like with the flame and his hands and all these things, right, create that kind of story of, you know, Petey Wheatstraw and the devil, you know, and all that becoming one. And so it's just and a flame, of course, you know, hellfire and all that. So we have just a simple shot, right? But they took time with the lighting, with the costuming, right? The placement of the not only the actor, but also the prop, right? So it's just a way to kind of, for us as an audience and for us as, of course, critics and scholars, to look at how visual stories are told as well in movies. Classic scene two, notice it's very kind of like dynamic, you know, when we'll get to dynamic and static composition and a couple other kind of uh, composition themes. But, you know, notice here, there's just the, the money, right, the power, you know, the happiness, the joy, right, that the contract initially brings to Petey, right, just like Faustus, right? So he's having fun, he's feeling powerful, right, he's feeling assertive and confident. All these things help create the characterization, but then, of course, create the theme that, yes, you know, even though, you know, being corrupt may feel good, eventually it will lead to your down own downfall and all that. So it just works hand in hand with characterization, theme and all that. Same thing with symbolism, the church, and we get a, definitely um, the juxtaposition of violence and then the church uh, at one scene. So just how everything is kind of composed here with this shot with, you know, the cars left and right. You know, we have our foreground, these three men, right, who will be revealed are the um, villains, right? Then we have the crowd itself panicking, right, because something's gone wrong at the funeral and all that. And so now, of course, Peter Reedstraw, you know, who, who's our main character, you know, you see him with his arms up, you know. And so there's something different going on. So all these things are there to not only entertain the viewer, but also to create a kind of visual story that's going hand in hand with the script story. So again, it's a very kind of interesting kind of concept when you study film. Now, concluding thoughts. So again, mise-en-scene affords directors more opportunities to be artistic, whether the film is made for mainstream audiences or more avant-garde ones. While the term originates in theater, it is not until about the 1950s when film critics and the French film magazine, uh, ooh, I'm probably going to mispronounce that, right? Cahiers uh, du Cinema began using the term mise en scène when referring to movies. So it's you know, still a relatively new term in terms of the study of film. It is now a crucial term for film studies to help think about how directors and cinematographers create visual stories and then, of course, create visual metaphors in their films and as i said you know pdw star is a straight-up comedy right and it's a very independent movie but even in a low-budget comedy you have the director you have the cinematographer trying to work with the visuals right so you know we don't want to dismiss any kind of film because a lot of time when you start studying how the visuals are arranged it becomes much more creative and much more interesting to talk about. Obviously, if you have any questions, post them to the Canvas Forum or email. If you need anything in alternative formats, always contact Accessibility Resource or myself.